Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time at First Baptist Church of Central City. We would love to have you, and thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Thank you all very much. Now open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 1 through 14. It's the third week in a row we're in Ephesians 1, 1 through 14, but I, I know for certain you all aren't tired of it yet. Uh, when you got somebody like me that can preach a passage three hours worth of it, I mean, I'm telling you, it's just good stuff, isn't it? But uh, in all seriousness, we're going through this passage, as you all know, because there's a lot to say about this passage. And first thing that we wanted to do, uh, the first week we were in here was cover the context of what was going on. This is These are things that we need to be very clear on as we read the scripture. So I would encourage you, if you didn't have a chance to be with us two weeks ago or last week, to go back and you can find uh, those sermons on our YouTube page and you can watch those. Uh, specifically, two weeks ago, we talked about the context and we uh, outlined how this passage doesn't teach the teaching known as Calvinism. And so we, we made that clear and we looked at what the we language and the us language was compared to the you language, talking about Jews and Gentiles and those types of things. So that would be helpful to you to go back and watch that, especially if you struggle when you read a passage like this uh, in really being comfortable with words like predestined and chosen and purpose. Uh, these are all biblical words. Uh, they're not in the commentary. They're right there in the text as we read it. And so we know that they're all true. Uh, we just need to understand the context of what's being written here so we can understand their meaning. Last week what we said was that when we read this passage, we see that all of these promises and all of these descriptions of God's grace in Christ are true for us. They're not just true for the Jewish Christians. They're not just true for Gentile Christians like us. They are true for all of those who are in Christ Jesus. And these promises and these descriptions of God's grace give us reason to rejoice. So this evening we're going to read the passage one more time. We're going to focus specifically on verses 7 through 14, but we're going to read the whole passage together at the beginning. So let's look now to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us and the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we do thank You for Your Word. And we thank You again for this time that we have together in Your Word. And we pray, Lord, by Your Holy Spirit, that You would enlighten us this evening to receive and understand and apply Your Word in our hearts and in our minds. We pray by Your grace, Lord, that You would use this time by the power of Your Holy Spirit to change us and shape us and make us more like Jesus, our Lord. 
God, help us from this time together to be able to go out and live our lives as living sacrifices to You daily. That we would tell others about Jesus and that we would be able to equip people to follow Jesus and make more disciples. Lord, we thank You for the love that You've shown us. And we pray that You be with us now. God, help me not to be a distraction and give me Your words to say for Your people. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's look again at verse 7. I want to read verse 7 through the first part of verse 8. And it says this, In Him, Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us. Uh, there in verse 7 it opens up, In Him we have redemption through His blood. What does that word redemption mean? A lot of us would tend to think that it means salvation. And we can kind of equate the two for being the exact same thing. And redemption is a part of salvation, but it's something more specific than that. The word redemption means payment. It is a payment for our sins. It is the payment by which we are saved. I want you to look briefly with me to Mark chapter 10, verse 45. This is Jesus speaking to His disciples in Mark 10, 45. And He said this, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Now that passage doesn't use the word redemption or redeem, but it does use the word ransom. And a redemption is what was paid for a ransom. It is how you purchased someone out of sin, purchased someone out of slavery. This is what God has done for us, the Son of God. He has died, He has given up His blood, a ransom for many. Redemption comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. As the Scripture says, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Uh, now look at Leviticus 17, verse 11. Back in Ephesians it says that in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I, God, have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Something the Old Testament makes very clear, except in the cases of extreme poverty where people didn't have an offering to bring, blood is required as the sacrifice for sins. Blood was required to pay for one's sins because sin costs life. And we learn in the New Testament that all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout those sacrifices, God was proving the point through those animal sacrifices that sin leads to death. It costs one's life. And so the people had to spill blood. They had to make a sacrifice in order to pay the price for their sins. Hebrews 9.22 makes that clear. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so when we read that Jesus has redeemed us, that in Jesus, back in uh, Ephesians 1.7, that in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, what that is saying to us is that He has paid the price. And what did He use to pay the price? His own blood. He didn't bring out a sacrificial lamb. He was. If you remember John the Baptist when he spoke to his disciples he looked and he saw Jesus coming he said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God has paid the very price for our sins in the blood of his son Jesus. And it goes on to say in the end of verse 7 through verse 8 according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us lavished on us. I think sometimes in the world we live in, which can be a very difficult world, life can be very difficult. And we pray for those who are lost. We pray for those who are sick and hurting. We pray for those who are grieving. Those who were heartbroken. Uh, we think about those who have lost loved ones this week, but many of you remember those loved ones you care so deeply about that you lost years ago. And time helps us to kind of move on, but it doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that you ever come to that point of saying, okay, I don't think about that person anymore. I really don't care that they die. It still hurts over time. And in the world that we live in, where we see suffering and we see sickness and we see pain and we see evil and wickedness, it can be tempting for us to wonder whether or not God actually loves us. 
But when we see what God has done for us, when we see what He's done through Jesus Christ, His Son, we can never doubt whether or not God loves us because He has lavished His love on us. We talked about this a little bit last week, but you slow down and you think again about what He has done. God is the one who of His own will and by His grace made us that we might enjoy life with Him. He's the only source and sustainer of life. And apart from Him, there is no life because He is. You remember Moses said, what do I tell Him? Who sent me? Say, I am sent you. God is. He is the source of life. But human beings, back to Adam and Eve, we rejected Him, turned away from Him, and we chose death. We chose to be apart from Him. The temptation we fell for was that we didn't need Him. We could be just like Him. We could be God's ourselves. And so we rejected Him. And in that moment, what did we deserve? Wrath, death, judgment, hell. That's what we chose. It's the course that we charted. It's what we deserved. And yet God lavished His love on us. On us. He Himself paid the price for our sins that we could not possibly pay. And again, the way that He paid it was He paid it by the blood of His Son. And all of those sins, all of those sins were committed against Him. Right? It's not just that we sinned and He has to come and clean it up. No, we sinned against God and He paid the price by the blood of His Son which suffered, or who suffered, at the hands of evil, sinful men. It's not that Jesus came and sacrificed Himself. He came and gave Himself into the hands of sinners. And He was sacrificed. And then what God has done is He has invited us to receive His Son. And if you remember that moment when He saved you, when He convicted you of sin and He drew you to Himself, that He would free you of that burden, that He would give you eternal life. There wasn't anything you had to come forward and do. It's not that you had to come up with the right amount of money to come to the altar and pay. God simply said, come to me, as the song says, just as you are. And then He adopted us. He made us His very own children, made it to where when He looks at us, He sees Christ, His very Son, and He changed us. He gave us the Holy Spirit that we could live a joyful life, becoming more holy, becoming more like Christ, and drawing closer to Him every moment of our lives. This is what God has done for us. He has lavished His grace on us. That word lavish means if you lavish someone with something, it's you're heaping it on. It is elaborate. It's luxurious. It is an outpouring. God has lavished the riches, it says, of His grace on us through the redemption that came through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at the last part of verse 8. On into verse 10. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him, Christ, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heavens and things on the earth. Easily the most wordy part of this passage. Right, you read that, it's a little bit hard to understand what He's talking about there. Uh, so instead of taking the time to really break that down and, and go through that, I want to remind you again, I typically read from the New American Standard Bible. And that's an English translation of the Hebrew and Greek that is very, very literal and very, very accurate to the point sometimes the English can be a little bit hard to read. It can even be a little incorrect for English because it's sticking to that original text. So I want to read from a different translation what verses 9 and 10 say. This is a New Living Translation. It's a little easier to understand, but the meaning remains the same. Here's how the New Living Translation has verse 9 and 10. God has now revealed to us His mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill His own good plan. Verse 10, and this is the plan. At the right time, He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. So going back to the NASB now, verse 9, what it's saying is that God has made known to us. He has shared this revelation with us. His people who He has saved, the mystery of His will. He has made known to us the perfect 
plan that he has, his plan of new creation, his plan of new heavens and a new earth that will come together, his plan of redemption and perfection and glorification and resurrection in Jesus Christ. He's made that known to us. People of this world don't know that apart from Christ, but we know that. In verse 10, he says Christ is the steward or the manager or the administrator of God's perfect plan. God has unified the Jews and the Gentiles in Christ. Remember, that's why we need this context. He's unified them and God is bringing everything together under the lordship, the kingship of Christ in the fullness of times. Meaning, the day of the Lord when Christ comes again. And so when Christ comes again, and we reach the fullness of the times, or the end of time and space as human beings have always known it, all things are going to be summed up in Christ. All things will find their place and their unity in Christ. Every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and this is something the world cannot understand. But it has been revealed to those who have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus. The last part of verse 10, into verse 12. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. Now what is that inheritance? Well, it's heaven. It's resurrection. It's eternal life. It's peace and contentment and joy and fulfillment in this life. It's the riches that can never pass away in the place where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot steal. It's the inheritance from our Father who owns the cattle of a thousand hills. It is the promise of everlasting life that only comes through Jesus Christ. It is the hope that we have that all things will be made right. That we will be with the Lord forever one day and we will be reunited with our loved ones who have trusted in Him. The inheritance is the whole world renewed and restored over which we will reign with Christ. All of this God has predestined for His people in Christ Jesus. It's all been worked together according to His perfect will. And notice here, we said all these promises are for those who are in Christ. But reading this in context, again, he's making the point about Jews and Gentiles. So when you read verse 12, it's talking about the Jews. That's what it means when he says this, to the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. You've got to remember Jesus was a Jewish Messiah, but he's the savior of the whole entire world. In Christ, everyone who believes will be saved. Finally, verse 13. In Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Verse 13, Paul addresses you also. And that's specifically those Gentile Christians in Ephesus. But it's us. You've got to remember that context. That's how we know this passage isn't teaching Calvinism here. And again, you can go back and watch that from August 18th if you want to catch up. But we actually see very clearly here that the way that the Gentile Christians in Ephesus came to be saved was by listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of salvation, and what? Believing. They listened to the message of the truth, the gospel of salvation, and they believed. And look at what God did for them in Christ when they believed the gospel. We're still in verse 13. By turning from sin and trusting in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection as their payment for sin, verse 13, they were sealed in Christ 
with the Holy Spirit of promise. Once a person has received Christ, and we're talking about true salvation, not someone just going through the church motions, but once a person has received Christ, that person is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It means you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot sin your way out of God's grace. Now, no true Christian wants to test that. Right? No true Christian wants to say, well, I've got a license to sin. We've talked about that before. That's licentiousness. But if a person has truly been born again, they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that word that's used there is like those ancient letters and those ancient laws that kings would send out and they would put their seal, that wax seal on that envelope saying, this comes from me. This word is my word and it cannot be changed. God has put His seal on us. And verse 14 is very important. Verse 14 says, who is given as a pledge, talking about the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a pledge of our inheritance. What that means is when you have the Holy Spirit, that's God's guarantee to you that you're His. That's His guarantee that you have been saved. The Holy Spirit abiding in our hearts is our guarantee that we truly know Him. We've truly been born again. That we've truly been bought and paid for as God's own possession by the blood of His Son to the praise of His glory. Remember, He's the one who has done it all. Now, these are just the first 14 verses of Ephesians. But when we read just these first 14 verses and we truly slow down and we truly take it all in, we have reason to praise. We have reason to worship. We have a reason, even though our hard hearts would sometimes make us a little cold to it and rob us of this, we have a reason to be absolutely overwhelmed by the goodness of God. Sometimes, many of us, it, it kind of hit me this year, uh, I always thought, you know, I'd become a Christian later in life. I became a Christian when I was 16. But all my friends, they'd already gone through all those things, several people I knew. And last year, celebrating my Christian birthday, uh, was the first time it marked 17 years. So I've now been alive one year longer on this side of salvation than I was, right? That makes sense? I said that in a very confusing way. You know what I mean. But ultimately, I think a lot of times when we move further and further from that moment, and especially if we can do like I can do sometimes, grow a little cold and a little lax in prayer life, Bible reading, fellowship with brothers and sisters. When we get further and further from that moment and we hear these truths over and over and over, and you hear about what God did for you, and you sing the songs and you know them, it's easy to get a little bit callous to it. It's easy to kind of know that you've heard it before and you just kind of take it for granted. But what God has done for us and for you in Christ His Son, especially when we consider the heartaches and the brevity of life, what He's done for us is overwhelming. He has lavished his grace on us. We wouldn't do this for anybody. We wouldn't love in the way that God has loved us. In Christ we can, but only by His grace. And so there's three ways we can respond to hearing that message. And the first is, knowing this is a prayer meeting, and knowing we hear some heavy things here, this informs us for our prayers and knowing how good God is. When God says, I want you to come to me, as your Father. And when you pray in my Son's name, I will hear and answer your prayers. This, knowing how He's lavished His love on us, should inform our prayer life. It should give faith and bolster our prayer life. It should cause us to be bold as we approach His throne of grace, knowing we have been sealed and forgiven. 
Second thing that this should cause us to do is it should spur us to urgently share this message with others. I've said this before. If I find a good hamburger somewhere, y'all are going to hear about it. I'm going to tell you, you need to go to that restaurant and eat those hamburgers they got. God has done so much more for us than provide a good hamburger. We shouldn't shut up about it. And a lot of times I think we get a little nervous about how people are going to receive that. But if it's really that good, they ought to expect it. And I think the trap we fall into is when we don't talk about it, they say, well, it must really not be that good. He'd really be talking about it if it was true. This ought to spur us to tell others, to make God's name more famous, to lift up and give glory to His name, but also for their sake, that they might hear that message of truth, the gospel of salvation, and respond and believe and be saved. And finally, this should give us assurance that we are sealed and in Christ we are His. Because sometimes what we can do is we can know how sinful we can be and we can know how we've made mistakes and how we've really messed up and maybe we let our temper go or whatever it might have been. To know that God holds us secure in Christ the last thing we should do is retreat away from Him thinking we're not worthy. Because by His grace, when He looks at us, when He looks at you, He doesn't see all your mistakes. He sees Jesus' perfect record. Signed, sealed, delivered. And that should give us assurance. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank You for Your grace that You have lavished on us. And Lord, we pray that You would use us this week to tell others. God, give us a sense of urgency to share this hope and this good news and this truth in this dark world that we would bring light, that we would not hide our light under a bushel or under a basket, but Lord, that we would set it on the lampstand to light the way to Christ. And God, help us to pray with boldness, knowing that You love us and that You hear us, that You respond to us, Lord, and knowing that when we pray according to Your will, God, You always answer those prayers. And Lord, help us also to know that we are forgiven. Help us to know that we stand secure and sealed in Your grace. Help us to know, Lord, even when we make mistakes and even when Satan would tempt us to despair, that You have paid the full price for our sins and help that grace and that knowledge to change us in our hearts and to make us more like our Savior. Make us able to love. Make us able to care for others. Help us to reach out and to be ministers of reconciliation. God, we thank you for this time we have together this evening. Fill our hearts with hope and use us in this world for your glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.